Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm looking at this gallery here. <clears throat> I, I will not measure up. I can just tell you right now. Uh, I asked. I should have asked the same question I asked Gutfeld when he calls to ask me to be on a show, which is, who, who canceled? <laughs> like somebody must have. But thank you to John and Erica for inviting me. Um, but I didn't see many show business figures here, uh, which means you guys are, you know, you don't like carnival people, I guess, which is good, a good, a very good, a good standard to have. Um, I know, I think Evan, Evan say it. I saw Evan, so it's me and Evan. Um, that's such a hard thing for people in Hollywood to accept that there are people in the world who think that we're not important because we think we're very important. Um, remember after 9/11, really 9/12, actually the day after. Uh, people in Hollywood were all, were all saying the same thing, which is, you know, we're next. <laughs> you know they're going to, the jihadis are going to want to get us next. You know, like they were going to try to fly a plane into these sort of low, boring, stucco buildings scattered across Los Angeles, you know, and maybe, I don't know, maybe disrupt the filming of ALF or something. I mean, who knows, right? But it was a very, very hard thing for people in Hollywood to realize that they just were not on the A-list of people the jihadis wanted to kill. We are like, hey, come on. Um, and the days after that, uh, this is all ancient history for some people. Or, or I, see, I even see some young faces here, which makes me, shouldn't you guys be out like, you know, marching for intersectionality or something? What are you doing here? Uh, like, come on. <laughs> uh, at last round 11, the industry got together and they invited Karl Rove. Um, people forget there was a time when uh, we weren't quite so furious at each other that, that you would invite Karl Rove in to talk about what Hollywood could do to help America and American image abroad. Um, and we were very pompously thought because you know we're the storytellers here, we're the most important people in the room, surely you want our help. And he came and he was very polite. I went to the meeting and what he basically said was, you know what would be great? is if you could make sure that the movies, when you release them, um, get to people, get to the armed for forces uh, first. <laughs> like, well, that's not what we were asking. Sure, fine. But I mean, don't you want us to make movies about American heroes that are, you know, you know, approved American heroes? Don't you want us to tell different stories? And he said, no, no, I really, and uh, it was Carl Rove who had to remind, um, the uh, Hollywood executives that really the number one movie star in the world at that time, and I think even now, it was a guy named Hrithik Roshan. And the number two was a guy named Shah Rukh Khan. Because the biggest movie business in the world is Bollywood, not Hollywood. <laughs> and actually where they tend to hate us the most in uh, Pakistan and uh, parts of South Asia and Muslim Asia and East Africa, they're watching Bollywood. They're not watching Brad Pitt. Which is again horrible, right? That's the worst news ever because we're First of all, they don't even want to kill us. And now they don't even like watch our movies. Um, but it's a very humbling moment, and I think it's a really, 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 really good thing for us to remember, um, all of us, that we think we're really important, and we think what we do is very important, and we forget that there are a whole lot of people who aren't listening. Um, and that's something I think we on the right uh, need to learn. Um, but I'm from Hollywood, which means that uh, you know, I really work with people who, who lie for a living. Um, I was my first, the, the first person who ran a studio when I first started working um, was famous for um, gushing and telling, and, and, and telling you how great you were. And there's a famous story about, she, she came to the, uh, uh, the, the set of a movie being shot, you know, the, when the studio president comes, sort of everything kind of stops and she was she sort of choppered in to the set. And I think they were filming something really kind of pointless. You know, half the time, most of the time on a movie set, nobody does anything. They're just filming, you know, I think it was just what we call a pickup shot. Just somebody, the star just putting a cup down like that, just putting it down, and you get the camera there. And this takes half a day, by the way, just putting it down. And just putting it down. Well, I'll do it again. Maybe that wasn't right. Is this better? Like, putting it down. And, um, you know, she's there for an hour, and she watches it. And then when the director yells, cut, and they're going to move on, she runs up to the actor, and she says, listen, that was really great. It was amazing. I mean it. I'm not even lying to you. <laughs> and what she meant, of course, was that I lie for a living, and you know I lie for a living, 
and I know that you know that I lie for a living, but in this one instance, I'm not even lying to you. And I think he took it as like, well, that's pretty good. I think I must rate if you're not even lying to me. And that's kind of how we learn, you know, to do things in Hollywood. So let me preface my remarks by saying, I'm not even lying to you. <laughs> Mostly. There's one or two things I might be fudging. You'll, you'll figure those out. Um, but I, I usually start by, I, I do, um, uh, I'm a writer for National Review. I write uh, almost every issue. And I go on the cruises. And I've met some very nice people, some very good friends on the cruises. And one of the jobs you have to do when you're a host of a cruise is uh, you sit at a, di din uh, a dining room table uh, at dinner with other cruisers, and then you gotta have to like, host the conversation. And if you're like me, I'm just taking this out so I don't go too long. Um, if you're like me, yeah, you think, oh, what am I gonna, uh, really? And then someone said to me, no, 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 it's really easy. You just go around the table and you ask the people there Simple question, right? Tell, tell me a story and ask them what the, the story that you want to hear. And the story I always ask is this. Were you always a conservative? Or did you become one? And if you became one, why? And I'll ask here. Who here was always a conservative? Oh, is that the game we're playing now? <laughs> OK. Really? Okay, fine, fine. Um, you're not even lying to me? Yes, you are. <laughs> Maybe you're not. But okay, all right, so, uh, then I'll start, since we're going to play the game where we're, oh, not me, I was always, you know, I was Martin looking at a picture of me and Barry Goldwater. Um, fine. Um, uh, I was a child of the 70s and 80s. Um, I was taught that Kind of like what people are taught now, actually, ironically, but America was bad, pretty much bad. Not as bad as people say it is now, but we, we were I was taught it was bad. And that um, we were pretty much the aggressor in every conflict in the world. Mm -hmm. And that we're pretty much the reason, and I'm not a young person, by the way, but, but, but that's what I was taught. Every one of my teachers that I can even think of was liberal. And so I, you know, I sort of believed it. I don't think I was, didn't really believe it deep down. I don't think I had any bedrock strong beliefs, but I kind of thought, well, you know, since everybody's telling me it's bad, it's probably bad. I think I actually probably announced at some point in, at the dinner table that I was a socialist. And uh, I think my father looked at me and looked at the food that he had paid for and thought, okay, you want to play that game? Then we'll play that game, you know? Um, that's kind of how I think about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's like the kid who comes back from freshman year in college and is sitting at the dinner table and so like, while they're eating your food that you paid for, telling you what a terrible person you are. This system stinks. Like, okay, maybe then don't eat the, you know, standing rib roast. <laughs> so I was taught that. And I was taught especially that Ronald Reagan was going to destroy the world because he was a madman and he was going to blow us all up because he was crazy and he hated communists too much. And communists weren't bad at all. It's a different system. And so um, in 1984, I cast my first presidential vote for Walter Mondale. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm the only one. Anybody in this room vote for Mondale? We've got one, two, three in the back, four. Okay. There are four honest P5, including me, in this room. The rest of y'alls, give me a break, right? So, um, when I started working, I started working as a staff writer on Cheers, which was a huge hit at the time. I have to say that because, um, you know, when I started working on Cheers, I would tell people and they'd say, oh, it's my favorite show. And then when the show was off for a few years, they'd say, oh, uh, that was my favorite show. And then a few years later, be like, oh, my God, I remember watching that show with my parents. And now I hear, you know, at my grandparents' assisted living facility, <laughs> that is the show. Oh, yeah, thank you. All right. I, I do have a young friend once, and I was talking to him and, and, and about uh, movies or something, and he said uh, to me, um, you know that movie where the two women drive off a cliff? Is that, was that Laverne and Shirley? <laughs> so the Reaper comes for all of us, my friends. Anyway, so I, I voted for Mondale, and then I was working on a fancy show, and uh, when you work on a fancy show, you get to meet people, and one of the people I got to meet was Ronald Reagan 
because in 1991 he was uh, in his office in Century City, the Fox Tower. Did anybody see Die Hard? It was the first Die Hard. That's the tower. And he had the top floor. It was really great. And my, I, and the, the, my boss has said, because I was a staffer, I said, go to, uh, meet Reagan and bring him a cheers jacket and ask him to be on the show. All right, it's easy. So I went, you know, met Reagan, and um, you know, you sort of like, I had my little cheers jacket. I was uh, 26, and by then I realized um, that he was right, and he had been right all along, and I was the idiot. So I go with the appropriate amount of contrition and appropriate amount of respect for the man who ended the Cold War, and I go on, you know, give me the thing, and it's like it's like, it's like meeting, you're meeting the president of the United States, even though he's the former president, still the president. You go in, and they lead you in. It's very quiet, uh, and you have to walk past Nancy's office. She wasn't there, thank God. But it, like you looked in there, you thought, "Man, this is Nancy's office." There was something about it, it was spooky. <laughs> and then you go in, and then suddenly you're in a room, and there's Ronald Reagan, and he's like, you know, hey. And he kind of comes around behind his desk, and uh, he shakes your hand. And when I shook his hand, and you know, I thought, oh, I'm a writer. I should have had something prepared to say, <laughs> but I didn't have anything prepared. So we sort of made awkward chit chat, and um, kind of a while, for a minute. And I said, Oh, uh, this is for you, Mr. President. And they take a picture, and you shake your hand, take a picture, you know, all that stuff. And um, thank you. And I say, um, you know. We would love to have you on the show, Mr. President, anytime you want. And he said, uh, well, that's nice of you, but I decided when I came back from Washington that I wouldn't uh, try to cash in um, and go back into show business. I was going to say, I wasn't offering you a serious regular role, old man. <laughs> Just a one time. We'll see how it goes. Like, but I didn't say that. Instead, I stood awkwardly. And, uh, you know, in those awkward moments where you just say something, you're like stupid just because you didn't want it, because it was, because you didn't, and he doesn't, he's not, he, Reagan was not awkward. He was just standing there like, hmm, this is, his, this is what I'm doing today. Uh, and so I blurted out, I voted for Walter Mondale in 1984. <laughs> Yeah, so like so those of you who have that secret, and I know there's more than four of you in the room, that's how, that's called courage. So I said that, and he kind of looked at me, and um, he said, because uh, that's his job, right? He's a politician. He's like, he, people have said awkward, weird things to him his whole career, and he's managed to be Ronald Reagan about it. And so what he said to me was, um, well, you were one of the few. <laughs> Now I was uh, I was 26, right? So I was in the full I was in the full energy of my youth. My brain was firing. I had all my brain cells working. He was an older man who probably was in the first stages or the second stages of Alzheimer's, and he kicked my ass, <laughs> which gives you an indication of just how good he was. Like uh, people say, uh, you know, he might have had Alzheimer's in his whole second term. It's like, yeah, that's how good he was. <laughs> Fine, he's still under the Cold War. Um, then, you, then uh, the only thing to say about that meeting with Reagan was they sent the pictures. Uh, you get, you know, they take pictures of you and they send them to you. In the old day, and, they, and they send the pictures to you. And again, if you're, you know, 30 or under, you can turn to the person next to you and ask you what that really means because they they take pictures on film and they and then they're on paper, and they send them to you. And they send and they sent along the negative. They're supposed to send the negatives just of you. But they, uh, somebody made a mistake, and they sent me all the negatives, either from all that week or all that, uh, uh, that day or all that week. Lots, I had lots of negatives. And you know, negative, you know, if it's a, just a frame, right? And if you stack, I stack them up. And it's amazing what you see. You see a bunch of people coming to meet the president, standing in the same place, just shaking their hands. And all the normal people, live civilians, citizens like me, were like, some bad, you know, the different pictures and like sometimes awkward, you know, and it's like uh, you caught it all. You know, I'm gonna take a bad picture of you, like all bad, weird faces. Reagan, <laughs> you could stack up the negatives, and it was like one image, because he was one. The two reasons: one is because he was an actor, and actors, you know, they have a spot on the ground and they know where to stand. They call it hitting your marks, what they call it. The other thing is because he's Ronald Reagan. 
And he always hit his mark. He always knew where he stood. That's a really important thing. The reason he didn't move around in the frame was because he didn't move around in his beliefs or his character or his politics. He was hitting his mark every day. Um, and that's one of the things that I wish we did on our side. Or I wish maybe our leaders did on our side. We don't do it as much anymore. And when we did it, we were pretty successful. Um, so that was what it's like to be a Republican in Hollywood. You get to meet the President of the United States. I always said that it's bad being a Republican in Hollywood, but the good news is one out of every three becomes President of the United States. So you get to like, at some point, you're going to either be the President or meet the President. But you're going to be very close. When I voted uh, in, in Santa Monica in my first, um, in California, before they, you know, before they had open primaries, and you, I was living in Santa Monica at the time, People's Republic of Santa Monica, they called it. And uh, I was voting in a primary. I think it was a primary. And I sort of showed up in the morning, and it was a, an old um, lifeguard shack on the beach. It was kind of cool, right? It's like Baywatch, right? And I walk in, and I like say, tell the lady my name. I show her my ID. Or I don't, I don't think I had to show uh, Just tell her my name, right? And uh, she's like, oh, Rob Long. We've been waiting for you. She calls up the other older ladies who are running the polling station. She goes, this is Rob Long. He's here. They go, great. So, so great to see you. Wait right there. And they go, and they turn around, and there's like ballots on the back table. And there's like stacks of you know, Democratic, Democratic Socialist, Green, Angry Green, uh, tons of parties. And then there's one <laughs> that has my name on it. And she's here. And they, she wasn't you know, dissing me or anything. She was actually thrilled that I was like there. They're thrilled. They gave me a lemon bar. And they kind of like followed me to the little, you know, you had to vote in, the, in a separate machine. And which is like, you know, it starts to feel a little, um, you know, civil rights-y, you know? Not really, but like you go and there's like a, lots of really nice tables with the nice plastic things and a nice curtain. And then over there, there's like a little crappy card table with one leg that doesn't, but, you know, going down. There's no curtain and that's, that's yours. But still, they were nice. It kind of felt good. And that's one of the lessons I learned in Hollywood, which is that, um, you know, you don't always win. You know, you're not always the majority. Um, and part of what we learn, and part of what I do every day, and part of what I think probably happens here every day, I mean, this is Silicon Valley. This is the West Point of capitalism. This is where people make billions of dollars and lose billions of dollars, right? There's something about a risk. Risk is important. Risk is interesting. Risk is what makes us, like, you know, progress. When um, Peter Goober took over, well, Sony, when Sony bought Columbia and TriStar Pictures and put them together in a Sony, and they put Peter Goober, a very, very, very uh, prolific, successful movie producer, they put him in charge. And then, you know, about three months later, they say, you've got to come to Tokyo for the big meeting of the Sony, you know, presidents of all the divisions, and you've got to present your plan for the year. And apparently this is done in some kind of incredibly, like, quasi-UN fashion in this beautiful room uh, where it's like Rosewood or Hinoki or something really beautiful and Japanese and beautiful. And you sit there and um, maybe it's like the, one of those, like, you know those uh, James Bond movies where they go at a, a Blofeld's room and it's like, like it's a great committee meeting? A bunch of people. And they all, have, they all have things in their ear because it's translators, because Sony is a global corporation. So some people are coming from Eastern Europe, and some people are coming from Argentina, and some people are coming from China, and everybody's coming and speaking a different language. They have translators there. And so Peter Gruber presents his plan for um, what he's going to do with the studio. And he says, here's my plan, basically. We're going to make about 20 pictures this year. Uh, about 10 of them are going to do OK. And uh, of those 10, maybe three or four or five, or maybe five bleeding over the next section, will do well enough that we'll really think about maybe doing a sequel. And then about five of them will do OK, and they're part of a sequel or part of the deal that we're already involved in. And so we think that they're going to be pro they're, they're worth doing even if they're not as profitable box office. And about five of them are going to be unexpected, unexpectedly successful uh, and are going to return a huge multiple. And there'll be two or three that'll be like monster hits. And the rest are going to be gigantic disasters. They're going to fail. Be giant bombs. Any questions? <laughs> so 
you know, some guy raises his hand, I have a question. And so he speaks Japanese or what some language is, you know, translated. And the translator says, um, the president of, you know, semiconductor something something wants to know, Mr. Goober san why you insist on making the bombs. <laughs> now, if you're a conservative, that's a funny question. If you're not, you think, yeah, why you we should just make those illegal. We should regulate the business so that you never make the bombs. You only get the hits. You only eat the muffin top. You don't ever get the muffin. And if you're conservative, you know that that is the way not only to bankruptcy and ruin, but also the way for a whole country to kind of lose its way. Um, the good news, though, is that we could get it back. So quick, brief history of, of why we're here and what, um, um, what the media landscape looks like and why, why it's there. Um, the movie business has always been a great business, right? Mostly because they get your money and then they show you the thing. <laughs> so if you don't like the thing, they already have your money, right? <laughs> TV is kind of harder because like they, you watch TV, you get your thumb right over that button, you're like, you don't like it, boom, gone, boom, gone, boom, gone, right? Movies is like, I got your money. You're not really gonna go get it back. And also, I have a friend, not a friend, uh, I met an old man once who was very, very rich, who ran a movie chain of movie theaters. And I asked him, are you worried about m the movie business now that everybody's got VCRs? Because that was a million years ago, we all had VCRs. And he said, I, I sell Coca-Cola, which cost me .0001 cent for $6. <laughs> When am I, I don't care if people want to, as long as people are paying me that kind of multiple, I'll be fine. And he was absolutely right. You know, it was an incredible business. Um, in the old days, um, uh, uh, the movie studios would send Pinkertons, Pinkerton detectives, to big, the movie, big movie theaters around the, around the country, and they would, for the 7 o'clock show, they would go at 6.15 and buy a ticket. And they'd buy a ticket at 7.15, because the tickets had numbers on them. And they would figure out how many people were probably in that theater. And they would match it to what, how many people the, 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 the theater said were in that theater. And they knew they were always going to get cheated. And you, you're going to cheat me. We know you're going to cheat me. But not, don't cheat me too much. And that was how the movie business, business worked. I mean, you know, it's like, it was, and it was really, really great. Paramount, the studio was producing, I don't know, 55, 60, 70, maybe 100 pictures a year in the, in the glory days. And then suddenly it all collapsed around the 60, in the early 60s. It all collapsed. Movie business almost fell apart. Paramount was like they produced ten, produced uh, or released ten pictures one year in the early '60s, um, and nobody knew why. Um, they thought they knew. They, they, here's what they blamed it on: they blamed it on television. People are home watching TV. Um, but I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what it was. And um, I have no proof for this, but I know I'm right. <laughs> Movie theaters were in movie palaces downtown in the city, beautiful old theaters, you've seen them. But the people from 1946, the end of the war on, had moved out of town and they were over there. And so you try to get the people to come see a movie, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go all the way back in the city, which is looked a little spookier now than it was in the old days, and you gotta park and then you gotta pay for parking, and then you gotta go probably have, it's a big deal. Whereas if you stay home, you just watch TV, watch Lucy, watch your show of shows, watch whatever. Like it's like in this Playhouse 90, it's not bad, right? So it wasn't that TV was convincing people to stay home, it's just that the screens were at home. And then somebody got the bright idea to move, build these giant multiplex theaters in the suburbs in the early 70s. And boom, movie business took off. The theater business took off, never looked back. So it wasn't TV, people were still watching TV. It was just that they took the screens and they moved them closer to the people. And now the screen is right here. It couldn't get closer to you. I mean, it, eventually it will, it'll be inside our brains or something. But for right now, it's, right, it's pretty close. If you guys want to watch a movie, right now you can. I mean, everybody can. I could. I could be watching a movie right now. Like, no, there's no barrier to that. The, the, the screen is right here in my pocket the whole time. That is a radical shift. That is a fundamentally 
crazy moment that happened in show business, in the entertainment business, in the media business, that the screen not only got close to you, but you got control over it. You got, you got a, an ability to start and stop and watch when you want to watch, when you want to watch. That's an amazing transformation from the old model, which is you drive and park and you sit, you watch, we get your money, you take what we, set, we serve you, to you carry it on your pocket, you watch what you want to watch, you stop it when you don't want to see it, and for some of us, it's you can make your own. More about making your own in a minute. So we all have this experience, right? Multiple channels, like, you know, multiple uh, unlimited store with unlimited bandwidth. As an aside, um, you know, the, the, the music business collapsed in the, night, in the early 2000s. And people said it's because of all the streaming and kids are like file sharing and all that stuff. Did anybody file share here? <laughs> huh. Yeah, right. Oh, we're conservative. We, we respect uh, intellectual property. Yeah. Whatever, right? But it wasn't that. It was that unlimited store width is also combined with unlimited, ban uh, sort of unlimited bandwidth, right? Ability to get, you know, stream with unlimited store width, right? You could now, like, save everything. Now, in the old days, when you got music, you'd, like, put it in your thing, whether you're really old, and I'm not even this old, but I'm kind of, you know, stack up the LPs. You can get them up to about five or put them in your CD changer. And then when you're done with them, you just put them away. And you kind of never looked at them again. Because it was like, oh man, I gotta get up and change that now? I gotta do that? No, but what's in there? I'll just listen to what's in there. So new stuff competed with new stuff and old stuff dropped off the horizon. Unlimited store width means that new stuff and old stuff is really the same. It's just, a, you just press the one button. It's really easy. So well, there was a huge problem because people were discovering music that they already owned, that they liked and hadn't heard. And it was only a few years before the solution to that was streaming services where you pay a subscription, which is now what we have pretty much for everything, music, television, movies, you pay one, once a month. The good news for us on our side is that in the old days, we had all these gatekeepers. We had three networks, four networks, better, three and a half, really. The numbers were much bigger. When I would come in the office as a young writer, come in the office on Friday morning, our show was on Thursdays at 9 p.m. I'd come in, and the PA would have written on the board at 10 o'clock in the morning what our rating and our share point, what, what our rating and our share was the night before. And the rating was about, a, you know, about a, one point, about a million, the way it turned out, and the share point was a little bit more than that. And the share was how many of the TV sets in use were tuned to your show. And on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, about 33% of all TV sets on in America were tuned to Cheers and about 29 million people, 30 million people a week. And uh, I was, you know, I was a moron. I came in and like, oh, okay. Where's the coffee, right? <laughs> I didn't know that that was gonna end. I thought that was the way, it was the way it was. I remember one day, we came in on Friday and it was like a 29 share. And everybody was like kind of freaking out. Like, what is that, what happened? Was there a war or something? What, what happened? <laughs> And uh, we, uh, there was no, we then, then Nielsen sent everybody a fax that day and said um, uh, there was a power outage, I think it was in Minneapolis. And so we, but we mistakenly added that in and so it made every, all those shares go down, but we'll re, we're recalculating and we're going to, and then we were back on 31, 32 share and we thought, oh, that's good. Whew. Now listen, by the, by the way, if, there, if, there, if I just had a show on right now that even got a 29 share, I wouldn't be here. Okay. <laughs> I would be like with Elon Musk, you know, whatever he's doing. I'd be flying around in my G6, like, drilling tunnels in under LA or whatever it is he's doing. That's what I would be doing because that would be a phenomenal, amazing thing that we gather all those eyeballs in one place. But the truth is that back then you could do that because you asked, there were only about four people, five people who decided what was on TV, maybe a dozen people. Because TV, there was you know three channels. Now, anybody can put anything on TV on what is essentially TV. This is TV right here. And what do we? What does our side do about that? We whine about it. We bitch and we moan and we complain and it's oh the MSM did this and the MSM did that and I have conservative friends who say to me like did you see what Rachel Maddow said last night 
what does it matter what Rachel Maddow said last night? N no one important to the conservative movement or convincing anybody to vote for a center-right candidate is watching Rachel Maddow. So the doors are blown off, the whole business, and all we do is complain and wish it was back the way it was. I don't know why, but what's all we do is we complain. I had a friend of mine told me a great story about a college football coach who said to his uh, uh, team at the very beginning of the season, he said, listen, I'm going to coach the way I coach it. If you don't like the way I coach it, uh, tell me. Don't go complaining to other people. Don't let me hear that there's like people complaining about the way we're coaching. If you don't like the way we're coaching, talk to me. He said, but before you do, remember, this, there's, there's, there's remember two things, right? The people you complain to, 90% of the people you complain to don't care. And 10% are happy. <laughs> and that's what we do. We complain, and we make the other 10% in America happy. There was a, a, a recent poll, literally crickets, I heard, uh, a recent poll <laughs> of uh, Santa Rica, self identified Republicans. Who are the leaders? Name five leaders in the Republican Party. And most people name Trump, which is good because he's the leader of the party. That's good. The other four were not politicians, they were personalities who appear on Fox News. And listen, I. I got a problem with Fox News. I'm on it. But they're not leaders of the party. They're celebrities. They're not leaders. They're well compensated television personalities who are entertaining and sometimes make you mad and sometimes make you laugh, but they're not leaders. I mean, here's a question to ask yourself. Well, sometimes when you read, and that happens a lot because Fox News is very popular. Fox News is, you know, 30%, their, their uh, viewership is 30% bigger than MSNBC. How many of you, when you hear that, think, yes? Yeah. Why? It, it's a statistically trivial number. On an average day, Sean Hannity gets fewer viewers. Sean Hannity, by the way, is very successful, very good at his job. But he gets fewer, view he gets fewer viewers than Jill Stein got votes. Remember what it is to get elected, right? Here, just to, to compare the movie business to politics. If you want to lose the presidency, you need to get 63 million people to do one thing on Tuesday in November, and you're going to lose because your opponent's going to get 65 million people to do one thing on Tuesday, which means that there's a huge, a lot of people, smart people, who are going to get out 120 or 130 million people to do one thing on Tuesday. If a movie studio, you know, we think we're so smart in Hollywood, could get 130 million people to watch a movie on opening weekend, that's a billion and a half dollar opening. That is not going to happen anytime soon. When a movie opens to 100 million people, they are popping champagne. That's a successful movie. If 3 million people watch Tucker Carlson tonight, by the way, I love Tucker, very funny guy, very nice guy, big fan. 3 million people, 5 million people watch him, that is fantastic. He's going to get rich. Fox News is going to spin off hundreds and hundreds, maybe a billion dollars in cash this year. This is great. It's a very successful business. But it is not, emphatically not, going to elect or help elect or move the needle to elect another conservative or center-right president. It just isn't. It doesn't have the scale. So. While we're busy watching it and having arguments with people who are watching MSNBC, it's a whole bunch of Americans who are waiting for anybody to pay attention to them. I did a, um, I did a poll. I actually did it because I couldn't find the number. So I called up a guy who's like a, a really good pollster and uh, was one of the early guys who predicted um, Trump's win. So I thought, yeah, he's smart. 
and I you know, said, hey, listen, we're all on the same side here. I got a couple of questions I want you to put in your omnibus poll. And he said, I'd be happy to. This is great. I'll do it. And then he, then he charged me. It's like, I thought we were, you know, friends. But no, we're not friends. So I paid. Uh, and I asked a bunch of questions. But the basic question was this. Like, of, of the people who are, um, I think we were pretty agnostic about it. You, you, uh, you weren't necessarily a Trump voter, but you were, uh, you know, uh, you weren't, you weren't, you, you were mildly supportive of the president. It wasn't, we weren't asking for you know, just people just in MAGA hats, just people who just you know, could find themselves allied, could, could imagine they would vote for Trump. I call them Trump curious, right? <laughs> um, uh, the question was, uh, agree or disagree uh, with this statement? Um, uh, uh, television, uh, broadcast television programming, um, consistently denigrates me and my values. Agree or disagree? And the Trump, you know, large Trump curious side said, <coughs> agreed with that, said we agree, 67%. It's a lot. But then just for fun, you ask, okay, those of you who didn't like Trump, didn't vote for Trump, what do you, what's your number? Their number is 63%. <laughs> Which means that the viewer is trying to talk to us in Hollywood. The viewer is trying to say something. The viewer has something to say and something to tell us, which is that this stuff isn't, doesn't, isn't the comedies we're watching and the dramas, they don't, they're not uh, for us. And that's a huge opportunity that Hollywood is not taking, which means that it's a huge opportunity for somebody to take. And what I find so amazing is that we're living in an age of miracles where I can press a button and like some guy, some guy probably named, you know, Mohammed, will show up out there and take me in his car wherever I want to go. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? We, we are living in an age of technological mir miracles where there's very few barriers that cannot be surmounted by money. And we're here in the headquarters of money in America. It's, there's so much money. It's probably, if, I, if I took a tennis ball and I threw it out of this room, I probably hit a billionaire, right? <laughs> or somebody who's going to be one like when the IPO happens, whatever it is, right? I, there's a lot of money here. People here solve problems. Here's the problem. If you don't like what you see on TV or in movies, you can make one and people will watch it and you can release it into theaters. If you don't like what you see on television, you can make a TV show. You can pay somebody, if you want to pay somebody down in Hollywood, they'll do it and you can put it on TV and people will watch it. And if you put enough money behind the promotion, the promotional platform, you could actually get a lot of people to watch it. That could actually happen. In as much as you could have a car here at Uber and Lyft and everything else, you could have that. That could happen. And yet, we'd rather, our side rather whine and complain about what Rachel Maddow said or what CNN did or small, statistically trivial things that we become obsessed with. Maybe because we like it. Maybe because it's more what we want. Maybe because we have, well, who knows? I'm not, you know, I'm not here to psychoanalyze. I'm not licensed to practice psychology in the state of California. But look at the voters. A lot of people who voted for Obama voted for Trump. A lot of people who voted for the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, voted for Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. They are trying to tell us something, just like the viewers are. You can either say they're crazy, which that could always be ca the case, but you could also say that they're just trying to get attention. They just want somebody to connect with them, connect with their values, which are probably pretty broad, and answer the questions they want. And that person, unfortunately, for the Republicans, is not the president. His negatives are too high. And it's not, you know, I'm just trying to pick up the, I was just trying to come up with the most absurd name on the left. And I'm like, well, it could be, no, it could be her. Wait, yeah. Elizabeth Warren, well, not Elizabeth Warren. It could be, like, pick, you know, one of those people. Like, it's, they're, they're, you know, when, when John Hickenlooper, who was the most middle of the road, moderate, pro fracking, pro energy governor of Colorado, couldn't say, yeah, I'm a capitalist. Of course I'm a capitalist. Like that, you know there's a problem. But look, when you lose something, we lost, right? In, in 2018, you ask yourself two questions. You always, people always ask two questions. What, did I lose it? Or was it stolen? And you always want it to be stolen. Because if it's stolen, it's not your fault, right? If you lose it, like, what did, you, what did I do? 
if it was stolen, or they stole votes, they stole. That's easier for us to say, which is one of the reasons why we say it to ourselves a lot. Because it's easier to say, oh, you know, it was stolen, it wasn't my fault. But ask, we should ask ourselves, who, who is not voting the way we vote? Who does not believe most of the things that we believe? Who we could still get? And so, I, I hear people say, like, we're losing. But we're not losing. We're not even playing. We're busy complaining. We're standing there, oh, there's nothing on TV that I like. I don't like those guys. To read the New York Times today was horrible. That's a very conservative thing to say. Like, it's like that old joke about, you know, the lady complaining, two women having dinner, complaining about the food. It's food's terrible, and such small portions. I hate the New York Times. Did you read it today? That Rachel Maddow, boy, I never miss her. Boy, she makes me mad. Why are you watching this? So uh, my message to you, and I think it's, it's especially relevant here in, in Silicon Valley, is there is an abundance of opportunity everywhere to connect with people. Not look, I'm not saying that you got to make a movie or you got to do a TV show. But I am saying if you did one and it was any good, and the first one probably not any good, so the second one, it's like pancakes, right? <laughs> you, could make, you, could, you could make a difference. But if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to you know, meet up with five billionaires and put some money together, um, which I think is a mistake, I think you should, there are other things you can do. I mean, what do we do? What, what do I ask people at the National Review dinner? I ask them to tell me a story. We all have a story. Some of us are lying about our stories, I can tell up here, but we all have a story. So we should start there. Uh, you know, on a, on a macro level, <coughs> I mean, you know, I mean, Ameri you know, you know, rich American history is with stories that we don't tell. I mean, I wrote some down just today. You know, the Dodge Brothers. You know the story of the Dodge Brothers? Guys who started Dodge. They're brilliant, crazy. They were like dilettantes and like zany and kind of partiers, and they love to race cars, and they. You read the story of the Dodge Brothers. A friend of mine is doing and trying to make a movie about them or a TV show about them. You read stories about the Dodge Brothers, you think, oh, that's Silicon Valley. It's just Detroit in 1917, but it's Silicon Valley. And they died mysteriously. Some say at the hands of Henry Ford. I mean, that's good stuff, right? <laughs> it's American story. Martin Luther King, you know, they asked him three times to lead. You know, the old guys wanted him to lead the civil rights movement. They asked him three times. He said no twice. Because he's like young and his wife didn't want him to do it. And so he has three. That's an interesting story. Here's a guy who did this amazing thing in the 50s and 60s. And they asked, and he didn't want to do it. You, I heard this great story in, the, in this great biography of Jeff Bezos. You know, he's driving with his wife and a friend of theirs. And they're driving across the country to start this dumb idea called Amazon. And he's so weird that they don't have any music in the car. And his wife and whoever they're driving with, they're going crazy. They're driving across the country, and it's like, can we just listen to some music? And he doesn't listen to music because he's weird. So, but he's like trying to be nice, so he goes into the gas station and he buys, like, you know, that, that used to be able to do this, like the weird off brand music you can buy at the gas station that's like not really music. It's just kind of like they, they skirt copyright law. Like, and he bought a bunch of that, and he came back to the car and said, Look, like, I got music for us. And they just didn't have the heart to tell him, You're so weird, Jeff. That's not what we want to hear. I think that's a pretty interesting story. I mean, it's a, this guy has done an amazing thing, right? Have you seen him play Hamilton? No. <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> For years, our side has been saying to the left, or to children, or to people who are not white males, you know, George Washington is a great man. He's as much yours as he is anybody's. If you came to this country two years ago and you raised your right hand and you swore the oath uh, of citizenship, if your parents were born in Eastern Europe, if you were born somewhere else, if you're an American citizen or if you just love America, George Washington is as much yours as he is mine. James Madison is as much yours as he is mine. If you were the children of grandchildren or great great grandchildren of slaves, doesn't matter. These people are yours as much as they are your heroes, as much as they're my heroes. They have as much to say to you as they say to me. And so Lin-Manuel Miranda thought, okay, 
I buy that. And he put on this musical, which is probably, in my opinion, the most patriotic piece of American art ever. It is glorious, right? It tells the story of the founding of the nation. And the premise of it is that these were great men engaged in a great, great struggle and a great, great project. That's it. That's the whole premise of the play. He did something that we on the right, and I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not on the right, but we have been complaining about for years. He did it. Where's our Hamilton? There's enough money in the conservative movement to fund this, to fail a bunch of times and then succeed, especially here, where what's venture capital but the failure business? Tell them the story. I mean, you know, there's an old cliche people say about politics. They say, uh, the, the guy you vote for for president, the person you vote for for president, is the person that you, you, know, you want to have a beer with. I think it's not quite right. I think it's the person who you think wants to have a beer with you. Hillary Clinton <laughs> did not want to have a beer with you. Barack Obama probably did. Bill Clinton totally did. George W. Bush totally did. John Kerry did not want to have a beer with you. Did not really want you in the area. And so I would say to you, if you're not making a TV show or you're not making a movie, and that's okay, you don't have to, um, you still have a part to play. You still have a job to do. And it's not that hard. Stop talking to each other. Find somebody who doesn't really agree with you. I don't mean somebody who's screaming at you. I don't mean somebody that you scream at on Twitter or that is screaming at Rachel Maddow or screaming at Sean Hannity. I don't mean that. I mean, find somebody who's normal, who's an American. Maybe not, you know, you're kind of American, but an American. And engage with them. Tell them a story. Have a story to tell and then ask them for their story. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do I believe what I believe? I just told you why I'm a conservative. Why do, they, why do they believe what they believe? Ask them that. You will find the power of the story, which is the one thing we do know in Hollywood, one thing we are right about. The power of the story is the most important thing we have. The ability to tell a story to somebody and listen to their story is the beginning of actual political change. That is what Every political movement in America has been about. And we have all the tools we need to do that. We have all the stories we need to do that. We have all the foot soldiers we need to do that. And we're not doing it. Stories, the most important thing. Um, somebody, I, did, I said this to somebody in, in Colorado a couple weeks ago. And they went, well, where am I going to find these people? It's like, just stop the next Subaru you see. <laughs> Chances are the person in there is like, you know, one needs to hear your story. And I usually tell this story because I think this is my favorite story. Uh, and this is sort of, um, speaking of lying, it's a little bit risque, but you all look like you're old enough to hear it. And it's a Rodney Dangerfield story. A very funny guy. And he said that he was once on a date. And, um, you know, it turned out really well. Uh, in fact, he, you know, they spent the night together and he woke up the next morning in her apartment. And he thought to himself, oh man, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get out of here? I don't know. And then she woke up and he said, last night was great. She, it was great, magical. And he says, um, but you know, even better than last night is today because today's Wednesday. And I don't work on Wednesdays. And so, Today, let's just take it easy, let's sleep late, and I'm gonna take you to this little greasy spoon I know for a really good breakfast, and then we're gonna go for a walk, and maybe walk through the park, and get on one of those handsome cabs, and drive around the handsome cab in the park, and maybe in the afternoon, we'll take a walk down Fifth Avenue, and I want to stop at T Tiffany's, because I think I, I think maybe I want to buy you something at Tiffany's. <laughs> and then we'll walk down to the Rainbow Room, and we'll go to the top of the Rainbow Room, have a couple of cocktails, and watch the sun go down, maybe dance a little bit, and then go have some dinner, and then we'll end the night downtown. I know this dive downtown that's fantastic, and we'll end there. How does that sound? And she says, sounds great. 
But, uh, but just um, so you know, t uh, today is Thursday. <laughs> and he says, Thursday? I gotta get out of here! And he runs out the door. <laughs> that is a good story. And you have a good story. Uh, and thank you for listening to my story. I've really enjoyed it, uh, and I am not even lying to you. Oops. It is, it's probably off topic, and you couldn't have prepared for it because it just happened. Oh, but yeah. uh, with uh, Elizabeth Warren trying to break up, you're here in the mothership of right. Silicon Valley of Facebook, and, and have any thoughts on how easy, how hard, how crazy of well, breaking up the big inter intercoms? I, I think it's kind of crazy. I don't, I don't know what you break them up into. I guess you force... Google to divest itself of YouTube, which is the second biggest search engine, I guess. I, I actually feel like two things. One, I'm against it, because I feel like these are companies that innovated and did really well, and they have competitors, and those competitors are it's as easy to type Bing.com as it is Google.com. That's the reason why Google is what you choose, mostly. But the part of me, then, is the, the, the really bad, nasty part, which I think we all have sometimes when, when people who don't like us politically are now kind of hoisting their own petard, is that people here and in those companies are uniform, almost, we shouldn't say uniformly, they're almost uniformly liberal, almost uniformly, you know, big government liberal. And they somehow think that the government, the reach of government regulation is going to go around them somehow and hit the other guy. And instead, it's going to go right to them first. And I think um, it will be a, uh, again, this is an opportunity for people on the center right in Silicon Valley you know, there are probably a lot of people who you could tell stories to right now who think, oh, you know what, on second thought, maybe I will send a thousand dollars of minimum uh, tax deductible contribution to the California Republican Party. Because that's the really the only way, that's their only protection. I mean, we're the only people left who actually emphatically, when someone says, are you a capitalist? Say, yeah. Everyone else is like, hmm, well, I hate labels. That's what I say. <laughs> Yeah. I have to, uh, just my own comment, watching John Hickenlooper the other night, that was cringeworthy. It was just trying, and they kept asking him, and went, no. Was and I, I mean, I, I was a Hickenlooper fan. I didn't understand why he didn't run last time. I didn't understand why the Democrats didn't, didn't I mean, he's just, he's a, you know, running as a modern Rocky Mountain governor as a Democrat. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good profile, political profile for national office. Um, and, <laughs> and, that, and he's just like kowtowed. Well, this is great. Just with the early questions. Early returns? Oh, early returns, returns of the night. Well, some of them are political and some of them are showbiz. Nice. So well, that's, that's perfect. So like we'll, there's a difference. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll go back and forth. Well, this is interesting. Someone wants to know, how did Trump win? Did he use his story? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think he did. I think he, he, look, he was compelling TV. I mean, everyone talks about how, you know, uh, they put him on CNN because, you know, they wanted to, they wanted people to, they wanted to tank him. But actually, he was compelling and interesting. And he kind of like, you know, he opened up the window of a very, very airtight, kind of incredibly kabuki theater uh, event. You know, these, these primaries, especially these primary debates, are so excruciating. And he kind of like, you know, he shook things up. I mean, I was a bigger fan of him in the primaries than I am, as a, than I am as, for him, just full disclosure, as a president. Um, but I think that's what people liked about him, was that he wasn't following a script. But unfortunately, sometimes the script is good. So <laughs> as a writer, like, follow the script sometimes. We have three that are kind of related uh, re regarding the message. Uh, first, very simply, and I quote, please explain why our branding sucks. <laughs> Which can go on to, uh, why can't the right hire a better storytellers? over their own facts, uh, we try our own narrative, and this will be interesting, if you were in charge of hiring messaging talent for the 2020 election, who would you choose for our side? Oh, I don't know. Um, I, look, I don't think that we're bad at it, I just think we don't do it. Uh, when we try to talk to voters, what we do is we tell them why they're dumb, or why we hate them, or why they're uh, gonna, you know, burn in hell. Um, we don't do a lot of listening, which is interesting because, you know, <laughs> I just love that. The, uh, I, it's an almost toxic thing to say now, listening, because the only thing is the listening tour, like the, you know, the politicians are always going on listening tours, the Hillary Clinton's famous listening tour. They never once showed a picture of her listening. She was always talking, you know, you listen. Um, I think that we've lost the thread. We, we also want everything. You know, we tend to be, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're a little bit, I think we're kind of brats right now. 
I remember talking to Republicans in, in 2016. For whatever reason you want to be dissatisfied, it's fine. But they would say, we don't win anymore. Well, really? Because we won the House and the Senate. We stopped a very, very left-wing president cold two years into his term, which is pretty good. By the way, a president who won 53% of the popular vote, we stopped him in 2010. And we had uh, more governorships and more uh, um, state houses than ever before. Wasn't that bad? I mean, you can't have everything in American politics because there's always the guy behind you who's going to push you aside. There's always the reaction. You can't have everything. That's why American politics works. That's why it's kind of fun, and also why it's totally infuriating to true believers because you just kind of just don't. You can't have everything, and I think we probably need to decide that a 55 percent, you know, or 55 percent ally is better than a than than purity. And I think we have enough stories and enough diversity on our side to win the day. I, I heard a very interesting, we were having a nice conversation last night, and um, an interesting little anecdote. Um, this is an anecdote, so it may, maybe it's worth nothing. Um, you look at the two big immigrant groups in America right now, East Asians and South Asians. They're conservative, and they should be proud conservatives. East Asians, not so much in big cities, mostly because um, if you were a Korean or Chinese businessman, business person, running a business, everybody you know in the city, all cities are run by Democrats. I mean, the smart move is to be a Democrat. I can't blame them for that. South Asians, not so much. But they just don't feel like the Republican Party yeah, wants them. Like, it's, it's a party for mostly Christians, and they're not. So do they fit? That's something we probably have to overcome. I don't mean we have to overcome it in some woke intersectionality way, but I mean it's something when you tell your story to somebody and somebody tells your story, their story to you, the chances are that that person could be one part of the fast-growing, most patriotic, hard-working uh, ethnic groups in America, the South Asians, and they might be, you know, I mean, I, the, 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 the South Asians I know who are even mildly conservative are like, they're so conservative, I'm like, hey, <laughs> keep your voice down. Um, they could be great allies. We just have to welcome them. Okay, we're going to switch over to showbiz here. Can producers tell which movies will be good by reading the screenplay? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have seen, I've actually gone to movies, paid to see movies, that I was like, you know, again, I'm being super honest, that I, I hate watched. You know, you see a movie, you hate watch something. People hate watch Rachel Maddow. I hate watch movies that got made, and I read the script, and I hated the script. It was so stupid. And I thought, I'm going to watch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to pervert it, right? I'm going to pay money to see this movie I, don't, I know I'm going to hate. And then I'm going to, like, talk about it, which I hate it for, like, two hours afterwards. And, you know, I see a lot of movies alone as a result of that. <laughs> but but I, then you go to the movie that had the terrible script, and it's good. It's like a really good movie. And I think it happens a lot the other way around, too. A really great script. You go see the movie, you can't wait, and it's terrible. Um, movies are magic. It's like it's something, TV shows are magic. You don't know all this stuff. You can't reverse it. If you could reverse engineer it, be everybody in Hollywood would be rich and successful. They're not. I mean, you can't reverse engineer success. That's what makes it a fun business to be in. Would you like to give your opinion on, as comedy shows have gotten more racy and risque, have they become less clever? Well, I, that's good. I mean, I think limitations always work. You know, limitations are things that, like, especially with comedy, that help work. Like, if you go see a play, you know certain things aren't going to happen because it's, you, you're watching it live. Um, and sometimes that's funnier than a movie or something where anything can happen. Um, I remember, this is not that long ago, 19, maybe 1992, getting a call from the network, from NBC, saying, you know, you guys are, you guys, somebody in the, in the bar calls somebody else a bastard this week. And last week you had ass. <laughs> so you can have one more ass between now and the end <laughs> of the season and one more bastard. But I really think that's, you know, and, we, and I remember thinking, like, oh, that's we're being censored. Uh, but in fact, I think, yeah, it's, it, it, comedy is about not doing the thing. It's, it's about struggling against doing the thing. It's not about doing the thing. That's not funny. The funny is, put it this way, 
A drunk person's not funny. A person trying, a drunk person trying to appear sober, hilarious. <laughs> This is a little blend of uh, showbiz and politics, and it's amazing. I love it when this happens, when you people kind of just co uh, co get your brain levels together. Uh, re regarding conservative movies like Gosnell and Dinesh D'Souza, why aren't they more widely, widely seen? It's, it's hardly even seen in your own area. Well, I mean, Dinesh got a lot of viewers. I mean, uh, but again, most of them already agreed with Dinesh. Um, and Gosnell, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's dark, you know, it's like mm -hmm. not, I mean, you're not tapping your feet on the way out of Gosnell, I guarantee you. Um, I think what happens for us is that we'll make a movie and it'll be a little bit maybe too, too much of the message. It happens a lot with comedies that conservatives make. We're going to make a conservative comedy. Well, no, they're already not funny, you know? Um, and I think what happens is that then they, they don't do so well and then some of the C. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, in fact, I mean, anybody, we're here in Silicon Valley. Who watches HBO Silicon Valley? Right. Super profane, right? Really dirty. So if you don't like that, you're out. But if you live and work in Silicon Valley or you have own technology or you know anything about it, it is really great. And it is super, super capitalist. Pro capitalism, pro, it's very conservative. It's probably the most conservative thing I've ever seen on TV. There was like a, a three-minute, did we see this one? I mean, I, I know you have to go, but I, like, it was great. Like, um, the guys are working on their little startup in their house in Palo Alto, and their neighbor, who is on the city council, who's a liberal, and they, made, they gave him a beard, and they put him in a wheelchair, and they still made him the villain. And he comes over to their house and he says, you know, I know you guys have a business here. You can't have a business and I'm going to, you know, you're zoning. And um, one of the guys in the house just starts yelling at him. There's like a three-minute monologue. Like it must have been four pages of dialogue. He says, you people, all you progressive bureaucrats make me sick. You bought this house for $8,000 and it's now worth a whole lot of money. You know why? Because people like us are building things in Silicon Valley and making companies and creating wealth and value and you know, bringing amazing thing products to the whole world and we're doing this incredible thing and all you can think of is like, you're zoning. And I was like, I didn't know you were allowed to say that on mm -hmm. TV. Like that's <laughs> like, so it's there. Yeah, there you are. Well, someone must be worrying about you in the audience. They want to know, how well do you get along in Hollywood? You know, I, 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 people ask that. I, I, I'm, I'm great. Like, I don't, I put it this way. I, the people know my beliefs, I guess. They may feel sorry for me. They may <laughs> think I'm weird, whatever. Um, but mostly they know, and I, mostly people in Hollywood are very open and kind of like interested. And if anything, they engage in a very, very civil level. Uh, you know, it's something that, I mean, when we started Ricochet, that was one of the things we wanted to do, was like create the sort of civil place where people from the center right could talk to each other. Um, and I found that in Hollywood, between me and people on the left. Um, I put it this way, I would much rather, I'm much more comfortable being a, you know, whatever they call me, the you know, rhino, squish, whoever I am, right, in Hollywood than I would be in an American university. I mean, can you imagine that? That must be really hard. Yeah. This question is, uh, the late night shows used to be funny, and now they're very political. Do you still, or, or do you know they still get the same viewership, and where are the conservative comedians? Yeah, they do get the same viewership, but they get a little bit more. I mean, not as much as Johnny did. Johnny got tons, right? Johnny Carson. Um, and we kind of think about that a lot, but like the numbers are really trivial. It's a couple million, two million, maybe less. In the demo, I think it's 600, 800,000. Um, and the difference between Jimmy Kimmel, and, oh, not Jimmy Kimmel, he's third now. Between, between, I get the Jimmys mixed up. Between Jimmy Fallon and Stephen Colbert, the actual number in the, in the 18 to 49 demographic, which is the most important demographic, which is no longer heartbreaking to me, but was when I turned 49 or 50, when I thought, oh my God, I'm, it's over, right? But it's not, right? Um, the, the number is a couple hundred thousand people. That's it. It is a trivial number. Do not trouble yourself with that. Because they're not going to elect any president, or not elect any president. It's just not important. And who the, there are a lot of there are, there are a lot of like conservative community. Most comedians, in fact, I mean, I mean, it's changing a little bit because of the sort of this woke business that's happening, and a lot of you know, there's a lot of um, 
you know, you know, I, what it would purging in that community. But like, in order to make you laugh, I, making you laugh that's a that's a an aggressive thing to do, right? I mean, for someone to say something to you that causes you to breathe in a labored staccato way, it's like you're cho being choked. You know, you can't and you can't fight back. You're just like laughing. That's kind of already aggressive, and so it's it's kind of hard to be like a super nice woke comedian because what do you you know, this comedian from Australia, Hannah Gadsby, um, she tried it, and it was, I don't know if you've seen it, and I, don't, I mean, it's 45 minutes of just chit-chat, <laughs> and it's not that funny. Um, so, I, 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 don't think it's as e I don't think it's as easy as it was in the old days, because I think now if you say the wrong thing, you could probably get run out of town, but there are conservative comedians, and they, um, and they are very, very funny, mostly because you don't hear it that often. And that's what comedy is. Comedy is what will be surprising. I get so one f uh, form of this question every month. And this month, it's because uh, you talked about stories. We have many stories, but how do you suggest for people to get past the censors of Facebook and Twitter? And that's a churning situation all the time. I don't know why you're on Facebook and Twitter trying to tell your story. It's only going to be read by people who already agree with you. That's how that works. Do it face to face. The problem in California isn't that people on, in your Facebook feed in Minnesota don't hear your story. The problem is your neighbors don't hear it. The California Republican Party, I think, is the third most popular party in California. <laughs> I mean, it's work to do right here. It's work to do right there. If you have a meaningful interaction with two people and it doesn't interrupt and you're cool, you don't start yelling at them. You don't start telling them how, what Obama did. You don't start telling them, what about Benghazi? You just like, listen, tell them a story about your heart and they'll tell the story about you. I mean, look, I hate, I'm, I'm, I hate, I'm not trying to get religious, um, although I'm about to, so that's weird. Uh, there's this, uh, I'm going to get it all wrong, and I, there are a few people in the audience who will probably correct me. Jesus gave him a speech, and he tells the fishermen, you know, just take me out a little bit so I can talk to the people, and they do, and they've had a terrible day fishing. And then afterwards, he says, let's go out into the deep water and go fishing. And they're like, dude, it, there's no fish there. We were there today. There's nothing. It's horrible. And let's just go out anyway. <sighs> so they do, you know, because he's a celebrity, and celebrities do whatever they want. And he takes them to deep water, and they throw their nets in, and there's fish there. And there's a lot of fish. And there's just two ways to really interpret that story. One is that it's a magic trick. There weren't fish, and now he's Jesus, so they're fish. That's, that, that happens, right? It happens. The wedding of Cana, there was not in there. Or the second way to look at it, which is the way I look at it, is that the fish were always there. They were always there. There are always people there. In fact, that's what he said. I'll teach you to be a fisher of people, it says at the end of that. There are always people there. You just have to connect. We'll just do a couple more, but... Uh, are there any mean ones? Everybody's been so nice. No, no, no. Well, yeah, we're, we're very nice here. And, I, and, I, and I'm not lying. I'm not even like... <laughs> answer. But if you like this sort of thing, if you... Uh, I know the, our members really like Q&A, I really have a personal sense to really consider joining Ricochet.com because yeah. it's endless q and It's this That's all the time yeah. with people who you don't know yet. And I've but, learned so much from people. Just to say, just about the great thing about Ricochet is I've learned so much from people just telling they tell their story. Sometimes people say, I have nothing to say, really, but I just, here's what I, you know, here's what happened to me uh, 20 years ago. That's fascinating. And uh, that's the beginning of real, meaningful interaction. I mean, that is what, I mean, I know we have to, but every move, every big change in American society has been basically that. That's what abolition was. It wasn't Twitter. That's what, I mean, this country, we, <laughs> we, passed a constitutional amendment banning alcohol. America, <laughs> built on whiskey. And we're like, no, we don't want that anymore. Now, a lot of that was that women got to vote, so you guys are not, no, that was true, right? But then we had to pass another one to get you repeal that, right? But how did it happen? Well, people just got in the back of their, you know, wagons or trucks or whatever they had then, and they went door to door, and they knocked on doors. People, you know, we make, I, I know, I, this is, I just, this is just the thing that's happened to me today, and it made me really mad. We make fun of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I know we do. We, she's absurd, right? Uh, but she, like, she, like, brought her sneakers and went in a 
machine district in a machine city in a machine state and she unseated a very powerful machine politician. We've got to respect that. Barack Obama, you know, he's the, the, com the community organizer in chief, ha, 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 like that was dumb. He won 53% of the vote. And we rolled our eyes at it, like, oh, you know, community organizer. Where are our community organizers? What he did was we went door to door, knocked on doors, and convinced people and got people organized. And instead, well, what are we doing? We're talking to each other on Twitter, and we're watching uh, Laura Ingram together. That is not how you get 53% of the American people to put you back in the White House or to put you back in charge, or to get the House back, or to keep the Senate, or any of the things that are the, all the moving pieces of the American politics that we all worry about every day. That was not at all responsive to the question. I know. <laughs> so there's, uh, there are a couple questions that deal with this. We understand we want to engage other people. And this is very difficult, especially when they don't, well, obviously, when they don't agree with you. Do you have any pointers? How do you get that started? Don't be a little aggressive. Any pointers <laughs> on how to do that? Yeah, don't be overly aggressive, that's for sure. Uh, uh, everyone's got a great story. Everyone has a story of why you believe what you believe. Tell it. And then listen to theirs. And don't tell it in the politics like I'm going to win this point or, uh, you know, well, you, uh, I'm not going to be happy until you admit that they were, did it first. Like, it's not going to get you anywhere. Tell your story. Mine is I voted for uh, Mondale and I was dumb because Ronald Reagan ended the Cold War and I was too stupid to recognize that until he did it and I was like, oh, damn. That's mine. And we're, we're back to television. I don't watch this show, but someone is a real fan of House of Cards. We want to kind of discuss that or when there'll be the next one? I don't know. I kind of got off that when he pushed the lady in front of the train. I'm like, really? <laughs> oh, um, spoiler alert. <laughs> it was like six years ago, so there's a statute of limitations. Um, I, I, I like anything that's politics, like I like that stuff. Like I like the first season of Game of Thrones, which is basically just, just wasn't chopping heads off and flying dragons, it was just like people wrangling for, you know, wrangling. And I love that, I love that. Uh, then when the dragons came, I'm like, ah, I don't believe in dragons. I do believe that people will do terrible things to each other for a small piece of the political pie, though. Well, we have a lot to think about tonight. Thank you so much, and we'll have a nice round of applause for Rob Thank you. Thank you.